You're listening to The Back 40, the podcast for Ontario farmers, covering topics and issues that matter most to Ontario agriculture. Brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm the host of The Back 40, Mike Bryan, agribusiness specialist at Trillium Mutual Insurance. For a country that has some of the lowest food prices that you're going to see anywhere in the world, you would think that we would not have anyone that was without food in Canada. But we all know that access to affordable, healthy food can be a challenge for some people in our society. I'm very pleased today to be talking to Jen Fenning. For those of you that have been with us from the start, you may remember that I talked to Jen more than a year ago about uh, migrant workers. One of Jen's passions is about food security, not just in Canada, but uh, also around the world. And I'm very pleased to actually be sitting on her back deck today, speaking with her about food security. Jen, welcome back to the Back 40. Thank you, and welcome to, well, our Back 40, I suppose. Ah, it's, <laughs> it's a beautiful day and it's a beautiful spot to be. So, why do you have such a passion for food security and the issues surrounding it? Actually, my first sort of brush with the concept of food security came from food insecurity in my own life. As a child, there was a period where my family had nothing. We were very close to not having a home to live in, and we ate thanks to the charity of the church. And so I knew early on what that was like and what it felt like. Growing up, have always been in food and farming and grown up in greenhouses and in fields. And as an adult, joined a family farm, the Fenning Farm here with my husband, and then joined the board at FoodShare. And that really kicked the conversation and understanding of the idea of food security and what that means and a whole world of things that a lot of people don't think about unless it touches their life directly, especially here in Canada. We think about hunger as being something that is somebody else's problem somewhere else in the world. And yet we have people in our own communities who are relying on food banks. And what does food bank reliance look like? And how does that impact a person's ability to access healthy, nutritious, culturally appropriate food? and especially fresh fruits and vegetables. And so joining the Food Share Board in Toronto, and I was lucky and honored enough to serve for seven years, which is the term limit, I really found that opportunity so enriching in terms of my understanding. And it gave me another level of passion for the subject and the policies that surround and impact that for our communities. My father grew up during the Depression, and he talked about how food was not plentiful when you get into towns and, and urban areas. And he said, one thing, though, because he grew up on a farm, there was always food. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it may not have been the choice of what you would normally have. We didn't have the choice, but they always had food there. And you would think from that time where we did see a lot of people in towns and cities where they, they couldn't access food, you would think we would have come away from that. But that problem still exists in Canada today, maybe not to the same extent that we saw back in the 30s, but we still see people that are unable to access their food. How big a problem is that in Canada? By the numbers, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. But I know that the demand on food banks and the various types of food access programs that exist, it's increasing. It's not decreasing. And it was increasing before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. But especially since the pandemic hit, there are a lot of people who were sort of on that line and were just, just making it through. And that precarity became then an, an absolute need. Mm -hmm. So some estimates are double to triple to even 10 times, depending on the area, the program demand. Our local food bank, just in New Hamburg, in Wilmot Township is a rural community. 
we have mostly farmland and only about 50% of our area is actually considered a town. We had a huge spike in draw from our little tiny, tiny food bank program. Uh, it overwhelmed the capacity completely, mm -hmm. and they put, had to put out multiple calls. The community responded, but even in a farming community, there is still enough need that it caused that draw. And you can be sure that if we saw that in a farming community where food is relatively plentiful here, we would see that in the cities and the towns and cities where you're further removed from the farming. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at Toronto, Food Share as an organization came out of the need for access to healthy food that's culturally appropriate, especially within the downtown areas where have what's called either food swamps or food deserts and people in those communities not being able to access a store that carries the kind of fresh fruits and vegetables that most of us take for granted having on our plates almost every day of the year. Now you've alluded to something there that most people think that if we just had enough money that would make enough difference that that, would, that everybody would have enough to eat. But there's other barriers to food security as well, particularly in the large centers, but out right here as well. What sort of barriers do you see to food security that are, are not directly related to dogs? Well, in some ways, yeah, you're looking at money being a, a very significant barrier. Yes. But money is also connected with so many other determinants of lifestyle, right? So... When you're in a community like that, your transportation is perhaps limited because you can't afford a car. You can't afford to rent one. You can't afford maybe to even have access to one at all. So then you're reliant on public transportation. And then where are the food stores located? You know, they're for-profit businesses. They build where they can make a profit. And that's not to vilify or, or you know, tear them down. That's Just simply a, a reality of the market. Yeah. We all need to make a living in order to be successful as a business. And so these economically less affluent areas don't tend to have the types of stores that have enough fresh produce and such. And that's something, there are a variety of ways that people are trying to change that. There are organizations like Food Share in Toronto specifically. But even out here in New Hamburg and in other rural communities, if there isn't a grocery store in town within walking distance, you don't even have access to public transit to get to them. But picture if you're a single parent and you're working maybe two part-time jobs to make ends meet and you come home after a long day of work and you've got to figure out how to get to a grocery store and get food and bring it home and cook it. But if you go not far down the road, you can get affordable caloric intake, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, that is more easily accessible, that doesn't require as much work and effort. None of us is able to say that we wouldn't choose that more frequently. And so we've made it, as a system, difficult for people in those areas to access the kind of food that would actually improve their health and improve a lot of things about their lives. And so, okay, you say, all right, we're going to use public transportation if that's available. Well, now you have to go half an hour or more on a bus then you go shopping, and you have to haul all of that home again. And you're fighting with crowds on crowded platforms, standing around waiting for a bus, whether that you maybe miss the bus. All of those things that add up to it becoming a very big headache, a very big stressor. Yep. That's a huge barrier. It's something that a lot of us don't, don't really think about, it, particularly if we have our own car and our own means of transportation. We drive to the store. We don't have to be limited to what it is that we can carry. We can take as much as we need 
with us and we're not limited because you can only carry a bag in each hand. Whereas if you're going on public transit, you're not going to be able to move yourself up that way. Mm -hmm. Some of the other things, though, and maybe you can comment a little bit on this, when we go into a store and we look at packaging sizes, almost always the cheapest is the largest. And yet for people who are struggling to make ends meet, those ones that they could most benefit from are the hardest ones for them to afford because they simply don't have the cash to buy it in bulk, even if they could get it. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's another thing, you know, if you're looking at $30 or $50 and that's your budget and that's what you've got to spend on food, well, maybe buying $10, $15, $20 worth of a particular item is going to drop your per pound price. But how do you afford that when now you've got to do all of your other shopping for the week or two weeks with the remaining $10, $20, $30? That's a hard decision to make. And so life becomes more expensive when you can't afford to invest in that sort of larger bulk item purchase. I mean, it, but it impacts all kinds of other areas too. When I talk to recent immigrants, particularly, and we're talking about purchasing and decision making around buying, it's something that I've often had conversation and, and myself coming from a space where I, when I was younger, did not have money. And I had to make some of those decisions for myself, even as an adult. Buying a cheap product, whether it's food or clothing or shoes, ends up costing more in the long run because you have to replace it more frequently. So if I buy a $10 pair of shoes versus a $50 pair of shoes, or if I buy a $50 pair of shoes these days versus a $100 pair of shoes, yep. maybe the $50 pair of shoes is only going to last one, two seasons. But if I have two children and I've only got $100, I can't give one shoes and the other one not. Right. So all kinds of ways that these economics impact people's lives and the decisions that they're able to make. And it's all great to say we, we should make better decisions with our money, but at the end of the day, can we? It gets to be a vicious, it's a vicious cycle, right? You you have to spend more, therefore you don't have as much to buy those products that you could stock up on that would save you money because you didn't have the money right now. And your, your barriers that you're talking about there, be it monetary or just the fact that buying a 25-pound bag of rice, you know, how do you carry that home? Assuming you can't afford it, yeah. how do you carry that home along with everything else that you've got? And the stores, the distance store that would carry something like that, and that's where we get into that conversation about food deserts, where there are vast tracts of cities where those stores do not exist, where the only food establishments are fast food chains or corner store type places where the portions are small, the profit margin is perhaps a little higher, and the price point for the end consumer is prohibitive, but when weighed against everything else, that's your only choice. That's where it's accessible. Yeah. Never mind what the price is, but that's where you can get it yeah. at a re in a reasonable time frame. Too. Now, you mentioned something else. You talked about culturally appropriate. And we don't necessarily, those of us who... Myself, white, white Anglo-Saxon, we don't think about that. The food system was set up by us, for us. We don't think about people that maybe don't like potatoes with every meal and don't like a few of the other things that we find to be culturally the norm for us. That gets to be a problem though, as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So that's actually a really interesting one, and, and it, it's a further determinant of health in general. A lot of Recent immigrants, you, know, you talk to dietitians, and a lot of recent immigrants to Canada or any sort of Western or North America end up adopting different eating habits when they arrive and end up with health problems as a result because the access to cheap calories is unprecedented in all of history. We have never had such cheap access to caloric intake that isn't nutritionally functional. And 
when you look at what they came from eating, what we should be eating more of as a species generally, mm -hmm. let's face it, the North American diet is not the paragon of a healthy diet. I would suggest it could be improved <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but they come here, and if you're looking for it, you can get white rice, you get white flour, you get all of these refined sort of starches that we eat. And they don't have access to, or it's prohibitively expensive. And that's a, the, the access point, right? Foods that are more nutrient dense and higher value health wise and culturally what they're used to eating, but they can't afford them. So they end up choosing these other things that are less healthful. And, I mean, we all eat a lot more starch calories than is healthy for us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting graph I, I've seen floating around in various iterations, but what we grow versus what we should eat is really interesting. Talking about food and agriculture and food security, that's a really important piece of the conversation. In terms of acres and tonnage of what we produce, that's a bit of a digression from the topic, but it is related. We grow far more starch-based crops than we should ever be consuming. And yet, that's where the money is. That's what our systems are set up for. We need to be growing a whole lot more vegetables. The, the, the truth is there's two parts to that. It's easy to grow, so we grow it, and it comes in at a good price. It and also it's shelf-stable. Yes, and it also has a tendency to make those products that are higher in fat, higher in starch, higher in salt, that once we start eating, we all crave those, so they tend to sell really well as well. So it's that double-edged sword. Not only is it a, something that's easy to grow, it's something that's easy for people to like and, and want to buy, which isn't necessarily what's best for them. And it's easy to consume. Yes. Whereas vegetables, you have to actually do something with them in some capacity before you eat them, whether it's wash them, peel them, cut them up, steam them, stir fry them. And and like you said, no, it's easy for us to develop a taste for all of these high fat, high sugar, high salt foods. I, I heard a, a interview with somebody about cheesies and what makes cheesies so addictive. And it's that you know our brains don't receive the message that we've actually eaten something. But we have the flavor, so we never actually feel we have, full from it. We have the craving, but never the feeling of being satisfied. Yeah. I think we've all been down that road before with a bag <laughs> of Cheetos sitting in front of us. Uh, well, I grew up vegan. Mm -hmm. And um, when we're talking about appetites and what people grow to enjoy and, and like, I actually don't like cheesies or cheetos or any of that stuff very much at all. I have to keep them out of the house. They are a weakness of mine. It's not something that I can really, uh, really would suggest in any state that I can really resist them. So I certainly know where we're coming from on that. Is your organization in need of funding? Trillium's Roots Community Fund is currently looking to provide money to projects for organizations in Ontario that are agriculturally focused. Applications are now being accepted for Ontario projects, including facilities or equipment upgrades, funding for research, innovation, and much more. To learn more about Roots, including how to apply, visit our website at trilliummutual.com and click Community at the top of the page. Our diet's really changed over the past 50 to 75 years because of a lot of that processing, but also because we've moved as a society away from the food that we grow, mm -hmm. uh, where 50% in the 30s lived in the farm and worked directly for farming, we're down to 1% or 2% of the population that produces that food. Mm -hmm. So we really have moved away from that, and I think we've lost some of that access or maybe even understanding of why we should have those vegetables. Well, I mean, if you ask anybody on the street, Almost everyone would tell you that in eating vegetables is important, mm -hmm. right? Nobody is unaware of the fact that vegetables are kind of an important part of our diet. And probably most people will tell you that they eat enough, mm -hmm. but that they could probably, should probably eat more. We all have that little bit of guilt, right? 
And dietitians will tell you that when they do a survey and people self-report what they eat, they will all over-report the number of vegetables and fruits they eat Mm -hmm. and all under-report the junk food, the chips, the ice cream, the pot. And when a dietitian is responsible for recording it and actually observes and records it, that's the only way you're going to get an accurate measure of what people actually eat. So there's there's a psychology for us, too, in that. We know it, but at the end of the day, we blind to ourselves a little bit, maybe? <laughs> we're, we're looking at life through rose-colored glasses. I know uh, I'm married to a lady who's a high school nutrition teacher, so this idea that I can get away with this, I find that she's my conscience as we go along here, that she watches what I eat, which is probably a good thing for me. We talked a lot, a lot about defining where the problem is and why people have a difficulty accessing good food. Where does the solution lie on this? Obviously, a living wage is a great place to start, but there's other problems we've talked about that are not directly related to the dollars. How do we go about fixing this? You know, it's a really good question, and one for which I don't think I have the full answer. Ultimately, food security can be measured on a personal level, community level, provincial level, Mm -hmm. regional level, and national level. At the personal level, probably raising the standard of living by raising incomes or, or providing better income supports and better social supports is the best answer. Mm-hmm. But from a community perspective and longer term looking, we have a couple of different things that are really important concepts for us to start putting a lot more effort and energy into. Number one, ensuring that people have that access ability to get to the place where they can buy from the place where they live and ensuring that farmers and a rural community is not just supported by preventing construction of homes over farmland but ensuring that we retain our vibrant economic capacity as communities Unless we're able to ensure that farmers are able to make a sustainable living doing what we do and growing food to feed our communities and keeping that food in our communities and reducing redundant trade is part of that. That's a whole other podcast. Uh, That's another podcast. (laughs) Boy, your face looked a little terrified there for a second. (laughs) But we have to start thinking about those things on a community level. And that's a municipal government engagement level. So much of our life is impacted by by our municipal government. But municipal governments are not really engaged very directly in food and food security and food sovereignty. And if we, as communities, as a municipality, as a province, as a country don't start paying attention to our food security at a community level, all the way up to the national level, we put our entire community, and in fact, the sovereignty of our country, in jeopardy. It's, we haven't talked about a national level or a world level here. We're in a fortunate situation in Canada where we produce enough food to feed ourselves. And yet we've seen supply chain issues, we've seen difficulty moving goods from one area to the other. And we we haven't even talked about the issues that are going on in Ukraine. But there's a lot of places in the world that are not nearly as fortunate as we are, that they rely upon that food coming in by boat or food coming in by transport truck or train because they can't produce enough. Mm -hmm. And that would be a terrible place to get to where in Canada... We join the other countries that are always knowing that we have to import food in order to live, rather than as we do now, just for, because we'd like extra variety and choice in the grocery stores. Well, and that actually is something that in the winter months, most of what we're eating, and even, even aside from the fresh produce that's brought mm-hmm. in, all of the frozen and canned, 
We don't do much of that in this country anymore. We it lost to, that. It's moved south of the border or to Overseas. Mexico or South America, or, or because we get a lot of that from now because we the processing is to be too expensive in this country, and, and we've lost those industries. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even China. This is where, at, at government levels, we have to look at policies that enable, encourage, and support that industry and bring some of it back. Yeah, when I was growing up, there was a vegetable processing plant in Exeter, which is mm -hmm. 20 minutes from my place. And we had a lot of farms in our area that grew candy peas and grew sweet corn. There was a lot of fields in our area that were taken up by that. When that plant closed, all of that disappeared out of our community as well. Mm -hmm. So if there's no place to process it, nobody's going to grow it. And if nobody's going to grow it, then we are going to have to bring it in from somewhere else. Yeah. And in this case, uh, probably the, one of the ones that was more recent is peaches in the, in the bag or the candy peaches where mm -hmm. they shut down the, the packing plant and the farmers took the trees out. And by the time the government said, well, we should do something to save that, what do we do? We had seven years to get the trees back in, and they're all gone because the farmers couldn't make a living doing it. No market. Yeah, and that's an increasing problem. Mm -hmm. As we have to acknowledge and account for global economic pressures in our food policies and in our government policies that impact food and, and food systems. And I don't have all the answers. Oh, anybody mm. who thinks they do is, is... They fail to understand the question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's complex. There are so many. I was actually having this conversation with somebody else yesterday. I talk about this a lot. I think about it a lot. We're looking at all of the interrelated things that impact food security. And we're talking about climate change as one of those factors. Yes, the person I was speaking with said, well, climate change has got to be opening up new areas for farming. And um, speaking of farming, that's, you know, one of the tractors driving by right now. So yesterday, the conversation I was having is saying about climate change impacting food security. And the person was like, well, not a farmer. Said, well, it's got to be opening up new areas further north that are now able to grow food. I said, no, you don't understand. When you go north of here, north of Kingston and up that way, the pockets of arable land are not just limited by climate. There's also just no topsoil. Yep. There's, there's a few spots that you go up and then get into the uh, clay belts up in around New Lister in that mm -hmm. area there. And that definitely, yes, that's going to open them up. They'll get working in this. They'll get working in yes, they will be able to produce more. But that's a really small area compared to what we could end up losing. Like, we're, we're looking now at a place like California, where they're starting to run out of water. But and, they've been running out of water for my entire life. Well, they're getting serious about it now. And what, what happens if we lose a place like California that provides a large number of the fruits and vegetables that we eat in North America? It's not like you can just say, oh, well, it's only you know, 10, it's 5 percent of the, of, the, of the arable land. It's the arable land we use to produce those fruits and vegetables, and we produce a tremendous amount of that. Losing that would be devastating to food security, not just in Canada, but in North America. Absolutely. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't understand. You're in North America, particularly, sort of standing on one leg, if you like, mm -hmm. in that we rely so much on that small area of the world. The largest carrot grower in the entire world is in California. And they grow something like 40,000 acres. That's really carrots. not that much. I mean, it's a great proportion of them. But when you think about 40,000 acres, that's a relatively small piece of land. The other piece, when we're talking about small pieces of land that have big impact on, on food security, seed production. Yes. Specifically vegetable seed production. And we've actually had a number of shortages in the last years where we were not able to access certain varieties because of crop failures that were due to extreme weather. 
most of the, and this is something a lot of people don't realize, is that most of the vegetable seed in the world is grown in very small pockets on the globe. And they're grown there because they have ideal temperature and ideal predictable climate conditions. But what happens when they no longer have those ideal predictable temperature and climate conditions? And that's what real climate change is. I often think it's a very, very unfortunate circumstance that led scientists back in wherever it was to to call it global warming because people got this notion that southern Ontario was suddenly going to become a banana growing region. And that's not really what global warming means. No. Global warming should have ultimately been called climate change from the get-go and people might have been able to wrap their heads around the concept a little better. Because, I mean, you and I both know what it means is more extremes. And that little tiny bit of difference in the average global temperature means more tornadoes, more droughts, more extreme flooding. None of that is conducive to growing better vegetables. And and we don't have to look any further than the weather that we've had this year, which for Ontario has been extremely dry. Not that we haven't had dry years before, but we have, and we will continue to. But if instead of having one every 20 years, you have one every 10 years, it makes a tremendous difference to what you produce. Mm-hmm. Like you can stock crop and that sort of thing. Absolutely. And we look again back to uh, south of the border and, and California, with us relying so much on that area, and they are still facing drought like they have never faced before for so many years in a row. And yeah, sure, they, they've had a little bit better weather one year, but aggregated over the last 20 years, it's not enough. Hmm. No, they don't get as much snow melt as they used to. Places like reservoirs like Lake Mead are, are getting extremely critically low. And there will come a time when it's simply the water will stop flowing because it is just not enough. Jen, it's been great to talk to you today. I don't think that we've solved anything. We've maybe kind of given some idea of the scope of the problem. We've really only scratched the surface. Always a pleasure to talk to you regarding various topics here. Just to give you a little bit of a, a little bit of a chance here, uh, Jen is uh, owner operator of Fenning Organic Vegetables, and that's an organic vegetable farm in the Hamburg area. But it's available in other places. How would people go about finding the vegetables? Well, you can check out our website, penningsfarms.ca, and we have a store locator, so you can look for a store that's near you. Uh, We do sell to Sobeys as well, but mostly independent retailers. Sobeys has been a great partner for us in the last few years, but independent retailers across the province, and feel free to pick up the phone and ask us. Jen, always a pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. My pleasure as well. You've been listening to The Back 40. Join us next time when our guest will be René Van Acker, the Dean of the Ontario Agricultural College at University of Guelph. We'll be discussing future job opportunities in the agricultural sector. That's next time on The Back 40. You've been listening to The Back 40, brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance. Be sure to subscribe to The Back 40 wherever you find your favorite podcasts so that you don't miss an episode. The Back 40, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm Mike Brine. Until next time, take care and stay safe.